Uh, I'll keep uh, the introduction short. Uh, basically, uh, Elaine Allenson and Stan Yogi uh, have written a book. Uh, wherever there's a fight, you're welcome to come up and look at it afterward, and they'd love to talk to you, I'm sure. Uh, so feel free to talk to them. I know we'll, some of you have classes uh, that you need to get to, so we'll aim to finish at 12.15, uh, but you're welcome to come up and talk afterward. Uh, but the book, Wherever There's a Fight, is about the uh, struggle in California for uh, civil rights and uh, rights in general. And uh, one of the chapters is on uh, the, the history, as Lori was talking about, for uh, uh, women's rights in, the, in California specifically. Uh, so that's what they're going to talk about today, uh, that chapter in the book. But again, afterward, if you want, uh, the book has uh, the specific chapter that they're going over here, or that their talk is based on, I believe. Uh, so you might want to take a look at that as well. So if you'd welcome Stan Yogi and Elaine Ellenson. Thank you so much, Doug, and thank you so much, Professor uh, President Gaskin, for, in, for that lovely introduction and significant introduction. And I'd also like to greet you, we would like to greet you for happy International Women's Day. Um, this is a great way to celebrate, actually, going through some amazing women in California history um, that we're going to share with you today. Actually, I have three things that um, I wanted to mark today as well. So as Doug mentioned, you know, we were specifically invited to talk about um, women's role in California because it's International Women's Day. Um, and I just wanted to remind you the origins of International Women's Day actually started with a uh, ladies' garment worker strike in New York. Um, and then a f that was in 1908. And then a couple of years later, um, at a meeting of women internationally in Europe, uh, to commemorate that strike and other women workers, a woman named Clara Zetkin proposed International <coughs> Women's Day. And that was in 1911. So we're actually celebrating today the 100-year anniversary of International Women's Day. We're also celebrating two other 100-year anniversaries today, um, or this, this month, which are both very significant. One very sa sad, one tragic, and one very exciting and hopeful. The other um, one, this tragic one, is that it's the 100th anniversary of the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which those of you who've studied labor history may have heard that this was a um, sweatshop garment workers um, uh, co a company in, in Lower East Side in New York with mostly immigrant workers. Uh, mostly women workers, and because of the safety conditions there, and because the owners wouldn't recognize the union, when a fire broke out, a door was locked, and the workers could, most of the workers could not get out, and 145 women workers died in that. That was 100 years ago this month as well. But another 100-year anniversary that we're celebrating this year is the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote in California, which was passed in 1911, a full decade practically before the 19th Amendment was passed, um, giving the right for women all over the country to vote. So this is really a very significant year. We have 100 years of history that we, we're going to look back on, um, the tragic times, the joyous times, and the times ahead. Um, as Doug said, our book, um, Wherever There's a Fight, how Runaway Slaves, Suffragists, Immigrant Strikers, and Poets covers a whole gamut of civil rights and civil liberties issues. Um, most of the book is divided by chapters on themes like the rights of labor, the rights of women, um, the rights of lesbian and gays, the rights of the disabled, the rights of immigrants. Um, and within each of those chapters, you're going to find some amazing stories of people. There's one chapter, however, that we singled out because it brings a lot of themes together, and that's the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, which we felt was the most egregious violation of civil liberties in the state of California in our history as a state, um, and brings together so many issues, race, immigration, um, use of national security during wartime, uh, the collapse of the criminal justice system, 
et cetera. So there's one chapter that focuses on that. Um, and then we also have an epilogue, which basically deals with what's been going on post 911 in terms of civil rights and civil liberties. And many of the lessons from the chapter on the internment of Japanese Americans actually have sad echoes today um, in that era. But what we're going to do today, as Doug said, is focus on the role of women in this state in fighting for our rights. And um, though we're celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage, there were many amazing women in California who fought for their rights that led up to that campaign and many since then. So we're going to be taking you on a short journey um, through the lens of women's rights in California from 1849 until today. And to start, I'd like to introduce my wonderful co-author, Stan Yogi. Thank you, and I want to wish you all a happy International Women's Day, and thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you enjoy our virtual tour of women's history in California. We're going to begin, if this works. Um, we're, we're standing close because the microphone only right. covers once. We, we like each other, too. We're, we're good friends, but uh, that's, that's Not that close. <laughs> So we're going to begin our tour in 1849 in Monterey, California, and this is a building called Colton Hall, which was where the first Constitution of California was debated and written in 1849. A little known fact about that Constitution is that all the Constitutional Convention was that all of the proceedings were conducted in English and Spanish. So recall that before California became uh, part of the United States, it was part of Mexico. So there were a lot of Spanish-speaking people in the state. So every resolution had to be debated in English and Spanish. And the eventual Constitution was written in both English and Spanish. So our first Constitution in California was a bilingual document. Um, that Constitution benefited women in many ways. So for example, Delegates to the Constitutional Convention did something unprecedented in other state constitutions, and that was that they included a provision in the Constitution for women to own property separately, uh, whether they were independent or married. So they could, married women could maintain ownership of their property, property separately, whether they acquired it prior to marriage or during marriage. Um, and the motivation for this was not because the framers of this constitution necessarily believed in equality for women, their main motivation was to attract women to California. So remember this is during the gold rush, and so the population of California at this time was 90% male. So the, the men who wrote the constitution were eager to get women, namely wealthy women, <coughs> the poverty provision, to, to come to the state. Um, the constitution uh, also denied women rights, namely the right to vote, and we're going to talk about that, that later. But the early legislature in 1851 uh, passed a divorce law that allowed both men and women, so this was unusual at the time, that women could sue for divorce. And just an interesting factoid, since we're in Santa Clara County, after that law passed, women were three times more likely than men to sue for divorce in Santa Clara <laughs> County. <laughs> um, and the motivation, again, was not necessarily because the legislators thought that women should have equality. It was that there were still few women there in California, here in California. And so if there were more women who were free to marry, if they were able to get divorced, then a lot of the single men could marry those divorcees. So we're going to move on. As Stan said, um, there were some <coughs> rights granted to women in the California Constitution. But those were granted to certain women, namely white women and women with property. Uh, Native Californian women and other women of color often found themselves outside of the protection of the law. And the story of Juanita, um, uh, uh, whose real name is Josefa Segovia, who is from Downeyville, kind of illustrates um, how vigilante justice um, in California affected women. The town of Downeyville is in the lush Sierra foothills, and it was actually at the center of the mother load during the gold rush. So two years after the gold rush started, by 1851, it had 5,000 people. If, if anybody's been there now, it's like a tiny little town with maybe a couple of hundred people. But at that time, it was booming. Uh, Jose Segovia, 
Josefa Segovia, who, uh, who is pop popularly known as Juanita, lived there with her husband, Jose. But because he was Mexican, and in Downeyville, Mexicans were not allowed to stake a claim, he worked as a car dealer at the Craycroft Saloon. Well, in 1851, there was a raucous July 4th Independence Day celebration. Whiskey barrels rolled down the main street, and tents were set up um, for miners to, to um, find their pleasure in drink. And an inebriated miner tried to break down the, the cabin door of Juanita's um, and, and Jose's house. Um, they fought him off, but when he returned the next morning, she was fearful for, that he was going to invade again. And she grabbed a kitchen knife and she stabbed him. An angry mob of miners demanded immediately that she be hanged. And though there were several politicians in town who had been there for the July 4th celebration, including a future governor of California and uh, William Walker, who had later declared himself uh, president of Nicaragua, um, very few attempted to stop this kangaroo court. The mob erected gallows over the rushing Yuba River, which is depicted here, and quickly sentenced Juanita to death. Though she protested that she had acted in self-defense, uh, her, her, pleas for mer her pleas for mercy were not, not heard. Her cries went unheeded, and she was lynched over the <coughs> river. This is a picture in San Francisco's Chinatowns in the back alleys where women who were forced into prostitution um, lived in the period of the gold rush and towards the end of the 19th, 19th century. So, and even after slavery was abolished in the United States, human beings were bought and sold on the docks of San Francisco. Trafficking in women from China began soon after the gold rush. Most were very young women, often teenage girls, some as young as 10, who were torn away from their destitute families in China, escaping widespread famine, disease, and civil unrest. They were forced to sign private commercial contracts that legalized their status as, quote, indentured servants. And once they arrived in the docks of San Francisco, they were lined up on the pier. It was called a barracoon, which people may know from African American history. Zora Neale Hurston has a book about barracoons. And they were sold into prostitution. We found one bill of sale um, in the archives that starkly attest to this. It said, Rice, six mats at $2, $12. Saltfish, 60 pounds at 10 cents a pound, $6. Girl, $250. The least fortunate among them were taken to cribs in the grimy back alleys near the docks and in San Francisco Chinatown, like this one. They were crammed into small rooms furnished with only a washboard, a bamboo chair, and a hard bed covered with matting. Their contracts required them to work until their passage had been paid, but their clauses in their contracts extended them for days off due to menstrual periods or illness. A historian, Lucy Chang Hirata, wrote, in reality, the contract system offered very little advantage over the slave system and was, in a number of ways, more brutal because it raised false hopes. Some women escaped. Some were rescued by Christian missionaries who took them into the Pres Presbyterian home in San Francisco. They actually rescued over 1,500 girls over three decades, but many never even survived their ordeal. This is a woman named Bridget Biddy Mason, and she was a slave who won her freedom in 1856, not in the south of the US, but in the south of California in Los Angeles. So in the 1849 Constitution, slavery was outlawed. So California joined the Union as a free state. But despite this, slavery was tolerated in early California history. So for example, slave owners who brought slaves to the state prior to 1850 were allowed to keep their slaves as indentured servants. And many slave owners, like Mason's owner, a man named Robert Smith, just openly flouted the anti-slavery laws. So Biddy Mason and the Smith family arrived in California in 1851, but in 1856, Robert Smith wanted to move from California to Texas, which was a slave state. In the meantime, Biddy Mason's eldest daughter had fallen in love with the son of an African-American corral owner in Los Angeles, a man named Bob Owens. 
So the Owens is arranged for a local sheriff to intercept the Smith Party in the Santa Monica Mountains before they were able to leave the state for Texas. And the Owenses took Biddy Mason and her children to a local judge who ruled that Smith had given up his right to own slaves once he entered California. So after she won her freedom, Biddy Mason became a nurse and a midwife, and she saved enough money to buy some property in what was then the outskirts of Los Angeles, in which today is in the center of downtown Los Angeles. Uh, she eventually sold that property and became a very wealthy woman and a philanthropist, which was unusual for a woman at that time, let alone a former slave. So if you're ever in Los Angeles on Spring Street between uh, 4th and 5th Street, try to visit this memorial to Biddy Mason. And this is a copy of the deed for the property. The, uh, the memorial is located on the side of the property that she first bought in what is today downtown Los Angeles. This is a streetcar in San Francisco in 1863. And um, a young woman named Charlotte Brown, who was taking that streetcar from her home on Filbert Street to her doctor's appointment on Howard Street, was had paid for her ticket and, and sought a seat, and then was told by the conductor that she would have to get off because, quote, colored persons were not allowed to ride. This was in 1863. The Civil War was still raging, and news of the Emancipation Proclamation had not yet reached most slaves. But Charlotte Brown fought back. She was the daughter of a freed slave from Baltimore, a man who had come to San Francisco, uh, set up a corral for horses, and also founded Mirror of Our Times, which was the first African-American newspaper in the state. And her father uh, urged Charlotte to fight this outrage in court. So she went to court uh, because just that year, 1863, although blacks in California were not allowed to vote, they were not allowed to go to public schools or to use the public library, a bill had just been passed that year, in 1863, um, allowing blacks to testify in cases involving whites. So she sued the Omnibus Railroad Company. And the company justified its action by saying that, quote, white women and children might be fearful or repulsed by sitting next to blacks. Well, the court actually ruled in her favor, but the um, ruling was diminished by the paltry sum that they awarded her, five cents, the streetcar fare. And even though Charlotte won her case in the courts, um, the, the, the streetcar company persisted um, in its practice. And a few weeks later, she and her father were told to get off a streetcar. This time, they sued again. And this time, a very courageous judge named C.C. Pratt ruled that not only was San Francisco's streetcar um, segregation illegal, he awarded Charlotte $200. And in his opinion, he said, the time has come to end the yoke of the white man's power over blacks. Um, for that courageous decision, which, as you will recall, came before the 14th Amendment was even passed. So he wasn't <coughs> relying on law. He was relying on sort of the morality of the situation. He was vilified in the press with racist cartoons like this in the San Francisco press and editorials that called for his impeachment and denounced Charlotte Brown and her family. It wasn't until two, de two decades later that the legislature actually passed a law outlawing segregation on um, public transportation. This is a picture of the uh, tape family in San Francisco. It was headed by Mary Tate Pier on the right and Joseph Tate Pier on the left. Mary Tate was an orphan in Shanghai, and she was adopted by missionaries and immigrated to uh, the US. And in 1884, they tried to enroll their eldest daughter, Mamie, here in the Spring Valley School in San Francisco. And at that time, the Spring Valley School was all white. And the principal refused to enroll Mamie because she was Chinese American. Um, segregated schools in California uh, date back to our earliest history. So for example, in 1855, the superintendent of public instruction said, quote, I should deem it a death to our system to permit the mixture of the races in the same school. Can you imagine if that was still taking place today? Most of you wouldn't be here in this classroom. 
1863, the state legislature excluded children of color from white schools and threatened to withhold funding from any school that violated that law. So African Americans were the first to challenge these segregation laws. And in 1872, there was a case filed on behalf of a 12-year-old girl named Mary Frances Ward, who had been denied enrollment in an all-white school in San Francisco. And that case went all the way up to the state Supreme Court, which ruled that although Mary Frances Ward had a right to a public education, she didn't have a right to attend the same school as white children. So basically, the court was um, instituting a separate but equal policy well before uh, the US Supreme Court instituted a national policy. But by the time that uh, the tapes tried to enroll Mamie in uh, the Spring Valley School, the legislature had eliminated all references to race in, um, in school laws. So um, after the school principal refused to enroll Mamie, uh, they brought, the tapes brought a lawsuit. And I just want to read a quote from you just to show you how fiery Mary Tate, the mother, was. She wrote this uh, to the school board and sent it to the local San Francisco paper. And she's making reference to the school board and uh, the head of the school board, uh, Mr. Mulder. To the Board of Education, dear sirs, I see that you are going to make all sorts of excuses to keep my child out of the public schools. Dear sirs, will you please tell me, is it a disgrace to be born a Chinese? What right have you to bar my children out of the school because she is a, my child out of the school because she is of Chinese descent? May you, Mr. Mulder, never be persecuted like the way you have persecuted little Mamie Tape. I will let the world see, sir, what justice there is when it is governed by race prejudiced men. So she had a lot of spirit, Mary Tape. Um, so after um, a court ruled that Mamie Tape should be enrolled in the Spring Valley School, the head of the San Francisco uh, School Board furiously lobbied the state legislature to pass a law barring Asian students from white schools, and the legislature did that. Um, so Mamie Tape and her uh, siblings were never allowed to attend the all-white Spring Valley School and instead had to attend the quote-unquote Oriental School in the Chinatown uh, area of San Francisco. And we're going to return to school segregation a little bit later in our presentation. I don't know how, how many of you have shopped around Union Square in San Francisco. OK, so this building is at 315 Sutter Street, which is just a block up from Union Square. Um, but in 1911, it was actually the home of the Votes for Women Club. Because in 1911, uh, women in California, as throughout most of the rest of the country, did not have the right to vote. They'd been organizing for the right to vote for at least 25 years in California. And in fact, there had been a ballot measure on the state ballot in 1896, which was defeated. They had gone to Sacramento, um, knocking on the doors of the legislature, who basically told them that the woman's place was in the home and they did not deserve the right to vote. Um, but women would not take that. So one very courageous suffragist, uh, her name is Selena Solomons. That's her, very form formidable looking lady. Um, she started that Votes for Women Club. And one of the reasons she did uh, was because she felt kind of like an outsider in the suffrage movement. The suffrage movement was a very um, upper crust, uh, clubby sort of movement, both in the East Coast and in California. And Selena Solomons was a Jew, uh, so she was not uh, you know, part of the sort of mainstream <coughs> Protestant uh, women's movement in California at that time. And she was from a poor family. Um, she was actually from a highly educated family. In fact, her, her brother, Theodore, uh, became the first cartographer of Yosemite. But her father became addicted to absinthe, which is like a uh, liqueur kind of drug. And uh, the family fell on hard times. And she had to drop out of school and help uh, her mother. So she was not that well educated, uh, except as she self-educated and became a very passionate writer and speaker on women's issues. So she felt that the women's suffrage movement was not reaching out to working class women. So she organized the Votes for Women Club, where she actually cooked and served lunches to shop girls in San Francisco's downtown and made alliances with the waitress union and the laundresses union. And she served 
you know, great lunches that were home cooked with five kinds of soup and salad and cake. And then she had a library which she stocked with women's suffrage literature. And she encouraged the women to read about the right to vote, um, hear lectures and cultural performances, and then um, go out and organize and walk the streets and walk the precincts. And she, in fact, was part of a major effort that went throughout California, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and in, and in the rural counties. Well, in October 1911, there was another measure on the ballot uh, which would determine whether women could have the right to vote. And um, the night of that, well, the, the morning after the election, the vote was so badly defeated, the measure was so badly defeated in San Francisco and Alameda that the Chronicle and the Examiner both had headlines that suffrage had lost. But they had forgotten to count all the votes from the rural counties. And in fact, there was a margin of just 2% where women's suffrage had won. It was a very small margin, but it was enough, as we can see and celebrate today, 100 years later, enough to change history. Many of the women uh, from that campaign went on to organize for the national right to vote, which was passed in 1920. And one of the women who was involved in that suffrage campaign is this woman. Her name is Charlotte Anita Whitney. And uh, she was arrested for a felony. And she was a very un unlikely felon because she was born into a wealthy and prominent Bay Area family that had ancestors who came to America on the Mayflower. She was the niece of a US Supreme Court justice, and she was very well respected, uh, not only for her involvement in the suffrage movement, but her involvement in social reform movements, um, like pasteurization of milk and health uh, issues. And she also served as the first president of the League of Women Voters in California. But despite her prominence and her family background, Oakland police arrested her in 1919 for violating the state's criminal syndicalism law. So this was a law which made it a crime to promote any doctrine that advocated uh, force or violence to affect political or economic change. And law enforcement officers used this law to target mainly labor organizers as well as political radicals, even if they didn't advocate violence at all. So Charlotte Whitney was probably the most well-known victim of this criminal syndicalism law. Um, and police arrested her for being a member of the Communist Labor Party. And at her trial, she explained that her party did not advocate violence um, or the overthrow of the government or the violation of any laws. But the district attorney who was prosecuting her insisted that uh, it was not only Charlotte Whitney that was on trial, but unpopular uh, or, uh, labor organizers like the Industrial Workers of the World or the Wobblies you may have heard of. Uh, as well as uh, unpopular political parties. So a jury found her guilty, and she was sentenced to serve from one to 14 years in San Quentin prison. And because she was so prominent, society women throughout uh, the Bay Area vowed to accompany her on a parade down Market Street in downtown San Francisco and to walk her into San Quentin prison, where they would insist to join her in the uh, prison cell. Um, although her appeal to the US Supreme Court was uh, denied, it failed. Uh, she never served time in jail, so this was a posed photo um, <laughs> for publicity purposes because of her, her social connections and her prominence. So after leading Californians, uh, including author Upton Sinclair, who you may have heard of at the jungle, and former Governor Hiram Johnson, called for Whitney's pardon uh, in 1927, Governor Clement Young pardoned her, explaining that uh, by sending the then, by then 69-year-old Charlotte Whitney to prison would only revive waning spirits of radicalism. So upon learning that she had been pardoned, Charlotte Whitney asked, quote, how can I be pardoned when I've done nothing wrong? Years later, in 1968, the US Supreme Court finally ruled that the uh, criminal syndicalism law in California was unconstitutional. Um, I heard Professor Pritchard talk about the First Amendment before. And um, this young woman, um, actually played a landmark role in fighting for the First Amendment, not just in California, but all over the country. And yet her story is rarely told. Her name is Yetta Stromberg. Um, and in 1929, during the height of the first Red Scare, uh, which was an anti-communist movement that was fomented by um, 
the FBI and others, the arrest of this teenage camp counselor, she was 19 years old, for flying a red flag at a children's camp in the foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains resulted in the very first ruling from the United States Supreme Court that protects symbolic speech under the First Amendment. <coughs> so not just your verbal speech, but something that you actually do, like raising a red flag. There was a red flag law in California. Like Stan mentioned, there was this criminal syndicalism law. And these were all part of an attempt to like root out what, they, uh, what the powers that be considered reds or subversives or communists or socialists or anarchists. And, but the red flag law was one of the more ridiculous laws that they passed. It had been passed in 1919. And it actually was passed in 32 other states as well. And it made it a felony to fly a red flag. So, you know, it could affect lots of different people for lots of different reasons. But obviously, they were trying to go after people they thought were communists. Well, at the time, Yetta Stromberg was 19. She was a student at UC Berkeley. And she was a member of the Young Communist League. She worked as a counselor at the Pioneer Summer Camp in this little town called Yukaipa, which is way out in a rural area. And the American Legion was very strong out there. And they told the sheriff that they thought there was a nest of communists out there and that they were flying the red flag. So one morning, that camp was raided by the district attorney, the sheriff, members of the Los Angeles Police Department Intelligence Union, and several carloads of vigilantes from the American Legion. Uh, when they were put on trial for flying the red flag, there were seven counselors who were put on trial. Um, they were all found guilty. And uh, Yetta Stromberg, they were all sentenced to five years in prison. But Yetta, because she had made the red flag with her pioneer camp, camp, camp children, she was charged with an extra charge of conspiracy, which doubled the sentence to 10 years. Um, when the sentence was pronounced in the courtroom, one of the, their number was not there. That was Isidore Berkowitz. He was a handyman at the camp who had earlier suffered severe injuries from being gassed during World War I. And he had been left severely mentally and psychologically disabled. And when he learned that he'd been convicted, he hung himself in his jail cell. Well, ACLU, the American Civil Liberties uh, attorneys, took the case. And they lost throughout the California courts, but they brought it all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And in 1931, a 7 to 2 opinion from the US Supreme Court reversed the convictions. They supported Yetta Stromberg's and the others' right to express her political opinion as a fundamental principle of our constitutional system. During World War II, there were some amazing women who became Rosie the Riveters. How many of you have heard of Rosie the Riveters? OK. So because so many men were sent off to war, um, and because the demand for ships and tanks and other war equipment was so great, um, Henry J. Kaiser and others built huge shipyards, both in, the, in Richmond, in Marin, in San Francisco, Oakland, and also in Southern California. But they needed workers to, um, to, to run these shipyards. And so they went to recruit uh, workers, women workers, who had many of, most of whom had never worked outside the home before, um, to work the shipyards. And as you can see here, many of them gained new skills like welding, electrician, uh, became electricians, carpenters, you know, all the jobs that women were told that they couldn't do, suddenly they were doing, and they were doing it to protect the war effort. Well, during World War II, um, President Roosevelt had issued an executive order barring race discrimination at defense plants. And he had issued this executive order because the leaders of the uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, C.L. Dellums uh, from California, and A. Philip Randolph nationally, had threatened to have a march on Washington because black workers were being denied good shipyard defense jobs and other defense jobs. So that executive order had been passed, which meant that all of the 
um, work sites were integrated, but outside the work sites, that was not, it was still segregated. So despite the fact that there was 24-hour childcare services for women workers, that was only for white women workers. Black women, who, many of whom had come up from the South to work, um, had to rely on their families for childcare. The dining facilities, the housing, was still segregated, even though inside the plant it was integrated. And one of the most amazing Rosie the Riveters that we were luckily able to interview is Betty Reed Soskin. She worked in the um, union office in Richmond, uh, which dispatched workers to the shipyards. And she's now, as you can see, a National Park Ranger at the Rosie the Riveter National Historic Site, which is in Richmond. Um, she's 88 years old, and she's proud to tell you and us that she's the oldest park ranger. And she is one of the women who keeps the story, both of the women workers and of the plight, especially of the African American women workers, alive and a meaningful part of our World War II history. So this is a picture of a couple named Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez, and they were farm workers. And by 1944, they were able to save enough money to lease a small asparagus farm in Westminster, which is in Orange County. And by virtue of where the farm was located, oh, I should mention that they were able to lease the farm in part because uh, a Japanese American family owned that farm and they were taken away and incarcerated because of uh, World War II. So by virtue of where the farm was located, the Mendez's three children, including nine-year-old Sylvia here, should have been enrolled in the local 17th Street School, which at that time was practically all white. So before the uh, school year began, Gonzalo's sister took uh, her children, as well as the three Mendez children, to the 17th Street School to enroll. And the administrator there allowed um, the lighter skin cousins of the Mendez to enroll in the school, but refused to allow Sylvia and her siblings to enroll, and said that they would instead have to attend the quote-unquote Mexican school, which had inferior infrastructure to the 17th Street School. So when the parents found out about this, they were outraged. They initially tried some political solutions, but those didn't succeed. So they joined with um, other Mexican-American families in Orange County to bring a class action lawsuit on behalf of 5,000 Mexican-American students uh, who were segregated. Um, the Mendez family hired an attorney who utilized what at that time were very novel um, legal strategies, including having a social scientist testify in court, an anthropologist who said that the segregation damaged both white and Mexican students by reinforcing false notions of superiority and inferiority where others uh, didn't <coughs> exist. So the Mendez family won at the uh, trial level and the school boards appealed. And by this point, the case had achieved uh, national attention because remember at this point, the Plessy versus Ferguson US Supreme Court decision which said that separate but equal schools were constitutional, that was still the law of the land. And so civil rights activists were hoping that maybe the Mendez case would be the case that would go up to the Supreme Court to overturn that uh, Plessy versus Ferguson um, precedent. And one of those attorneys was a young NAACP lawyer named Thurgood Marshall, whose name may be familiar to you because he went on to become a US Supreme Court justice. So in 1947, the appeals court upheld the lower court ruling and said that segregation of Mexican-American students was unconstitutional. The school districts didn't appeal, so the case never went up to the US Supreme Court, so it didn't overturn the Plessy versus Ferguson uh, precedent. That happened several years later in a case called Brown versus the Board of Education, which was argued by uh, Thurgood Marshall before the US Supreme Court. Uh, the Mendez case did, however, serve as a precedent in western states, Texas and Arizona, to bar uh, segregation of Mexican-American students. And it also spurred uh, then Governor uh, Earl Warren to sign a law outlawing all segregation in um, schools in California. And Earl Warren, by the way, went on to become the Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court that decided the Brown versus Board of Education case. This is a photo of a group of professors from San Francisco State University who were fired because they refused to sign a state loyalty oath. So after World War II, our ally, the Soviet Union, became our Cold War enemy. So anybody who was suspected of having sympathies with the Soviet Union or identifying with leftist organizations was the target of um, surveillance and spying. 
And in 1950, the state legislature required every state employee to sign what was called the Levering Act, which was named after its sponsor, um, an assembly member named uh, Harold Levering. And that, that act forced state employees to sign an oath stating that uh, they did not advocate the overthrow of the government or belong to any subversive groups. So every state employee, so your professors would have had to assign this. If you work at the bookstore here, you would have had to have signed this oath. And these nine professors uh, from San Francisco State refused to sign the oath, not necessarily because they advocated the overthrow of the government, but because they believed that oath violated their First Amendment rights to free association. Uh, so they were fired for this, and many of them, like Fizz Maisie, who is here, um, uh, had trouble finding jobs afterwards. So Fizz Maisie actually was a neighbor of, of Elaine's for many years. In 1950, she was a young journalism teacher at San Francisco State University, and she was also the sponsor for the school paper. And in the summer of 1950, this is soon after the Korean War had began, there was an editor on the student paper who was in favor of the war. Uh, he refused to allow any uh, editorials or articles uh, against the war in the school paper. He also didn't attend class or turn, turn in any assignments. So for that, she failed him. Um, he complained to school administrators as well as to the press that, he, that Fizz Maisie failed him because of his political uh, beliefs. Um, so she was fired eventually for not signing the loyalty oath. She had trouble finding jobs like many of the other professors depicted here. Uh, she was able to secure a job at a, a clothing manufacturing plant but soon after the FBI visited her employers, she was fired. Um, she eventually went on to become a photographer, an independent photographer to support her family. And uh, belatedly, in 1967, the Supreme Court ruled that the Levering Oath was unconstitutional. And she was eventually hired back at San Francisco State University in 1978. So this is like 28 years after she had initially been fired. So she was ultimately vindicated, but she had a hard life in between the time she was fired um, and when she was rehired. This uh, yellow house is in San Francisco, and in 1959, a couple named Seaborn and Jean Burks tried to purchase it, and they offered the asking price of $27,000, but the developer refused to sell to them because they were black. Uh, that same year, there was a state law that was passed called the Civil Rights Act that barred discrimination in all business establishments based on race, national origin, religion, and so forth. So the Burks sued for damages. Their case went all the way up to the California Supreme Court, and they won. This is a picture of the Burks family. Uh, Jean Burks was a school teacher, a sixth grade teacher, and Seaborn Burks was a small business owner. But despite this victory, uh, African Americans and Latinos still faced discrimination in housing. So for example, developers often told would-be buyers that a development was suddenly sold out, or that the bank that was working with the development on mortgage loans had frozen those loans. So in 1963, the state legislature passed another law that barred racial discrimination in all housing transactions. So in response to this, the California Real Estate Association and similar groups qualified an initiative for the November 1964 ballot called Proposition 14. And what that proposition would do would be to amend the state constitution to rescind all existing fair housing laws and to prevent the legislature from ever passing laws that would bar discrimination based on race in housing transactions. And that passed two to one. Uh, there were two couples in California who sued. Um, they had to sue in federal court because this amended the state constitution, so they couldn't sue in state court. Um, and the US Supreme Court in 1967 ruled that Proposition 14 violated the federal constitution's guarantee of equal protection under the laws. Do people recognize this woman? Anybody? Yes, Dolores Huerta. Dolores Huerta. <laughs> Dolores Huerta was a founder and uh, vice president of the United Farm Workers Union. Um, she's actually still very active. So um, farm workers in California and throughout the country were the only workers that were actually left out of the federal uh, labor laws, the National Labor Relations Act. As a result, that was as a result of the uh, power of the agribusiness lobby um, who did not want their workers unionized. And so there had been many, many attempts from the industrial workers of the world, as Stan mentioned earlier, the Wobblies in the early teens um, and in the 30s to organize unions in California. And they had all failed because um, the power of agribusiness was so strong they were able to find other workers to fill um, 
the slots in the field. That was until 1965 when Filipino workers in the um, Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee and Mexican workers and the United Farm Workers joined forces and called a strike in the grapes in 1965 in Delano, California. And this is a picture of Dolores Huerta at that time with her sign saying, Huelga, strike, which was um, calling people to come out of the fields. Um, they were protesting not only that they couldn't have a union, but conditions like child labor in the fields, no protection from pesticides, lack of drinking water and uh, toilets in the fields, um, and, and wages which really fluctuated uh, and were, they were never guaranteed because there was no union contract. Um, well, that strike lasted um, for five years, literally, until 1970, when because of the strike and because of the support of the boycott um, of grapes, table grapes, around the country and around the world, um, the union won its contract. Uh, Dolores Huerta is still active. Stan and I just saw her a couple of weeks ago because the headquarters of the union, um, which is called 40 Acres, it's right outside of Delano, was just made a national historic site. So there was Dolores Huerta, who used to stand, stand on top of picket, uh, on, on uh, tr uh, pickup trucks, you know, with signs, and has been in all the dusty fields. She was standing up on a platform with the Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, because they made that a national historic site. Um, the pro-choice movement, which uh, really gained strength um, in California in the 1960s and 70s, was very important in giving women a voice over uh, who would have control over their bodies. So. Actually, abortion had been outlawed as early as 1850 in California, and in 1851, another law was passed that said that no one could even advise anyone about an abortion, advertise, or give information about it. So um, the pro-choice movement had many facets. These are marches in the streets. There were efforts in the legislature. There were efforts in the courtroom. Um, but during the course of it, many people were arrested, including a woman in San Mateo named Pat McGinnis, who was arrested simply for passing out leaflets about classes, about learning about abortion. She was convicted of that old law, um, and the ACLU again came to her support um, and was able to get it overturned on the grounds of freedom of expression, that no, uh, no one should uh, not be prohibited from talking about something as important as a woman's right to choose. And um, also in the 70s was a time of the fight for, um, uh, against sex dis discrimination at work. Because many of you today may not realize that women were barred from many professions, even after their training in World War II in the trades, they were barred from many of those professions, both by unions and sometimes by law. And um, there were ads in the paper, want ads for jobs that were divided, men and women. And if you were a woman, you couldn't, you couldn't even apply for the jobs that were for men, which were, of course, mostly in the higher paying jobs. Um, Lillian Garland, who's the woman in the center, um, faced this discri discrimination head on, and t her case went all the way up to the US Supreme Court. There was a law passed in California called the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which said that a woman who is pregnant is allowed to have four months leave from her job and has the right to return to her same job when she comes back. Well, Lillian Garland uh, went on leave when she became pregnant. She needed to extend her leave because of complications of the pregnancy. And when she went back to work, she was told, sorry, your job is gone. There's no job for her. So here she was unemployed with a new baby. She got evicted from her apartment. She did not know where to turn. So she went to an organization called the Employment Law Center and met this attorney on the left, Pat Shu, uh, who took her case all the way that's Pat Shue on the left, um, she, on the right, sorry, <laughs> um, all the way to the US Supreme Court, which actually ruled in favor of Lillian Garland and said, that's right, um, her job should have been there for her. This law is constitutional. By the way, 
The, on the other side, uh, her employer was Cal Fed Bank, and they were joined by the Chamber of Commerce. So when you think about the benign aspect of the Chamber of Commerce representing businesses, remember that they also fought against workers' rights and women's rights. So this is a photo of uh, Phyllis Lyon here and Dale Martin here. And they uh, met in Seattle in 1950 when both worked as editors of trade magazines. And they fell in love. And in 1952, they moved to the Bay Area where they had the prior uh, to living in Seattle, and they settled on Castro Street, in which was then, in what was then a largely Irish Catholic neighborhood in San Francisco. And in 1955, they joined with three other lesbian couples to form a group called Daughters of Belitis, as a social group for lesbians. And that group soon, soon transformed into an organization with the goal of educating the general public to quote, accept the lesbian as an individual and eliminate the prejudice which places oppressive limitations on her, which was quite an amazing uh, goal in 1955. It was very brave of uh, Phyllis Lyon and Del Morton and the other women to form Daughters of Belitis because in 1955 being gay was a crime. Lesbians and gay men were routinely fired for being gay and they were harassed and entrapped by the police regularly. In 1947, President Truman initiated a federal anti-gay purge, so excluding gay people from employment in civil service jobs, the military, and naturalization rights. Um, in 1956, the Daughters of Belitis began publishing a groundbreaking monthly magazine called The Ladder, and Phyllis Lyon was the first editor of that. And that magazine circulated worldwide because in 1955 there were no publications, today there are not very many publications for lesbians. Um, and over Memorial Day weekend in 1960, the Daughters of Belitis hosted the first public gathering in the United States of lesbians. It was called it was a conference called A Look at the Lesbian. Um, and it was held in a hotel near San Francisco's Civic Center. The event drew 200 women, but also the city's police and CIA agents uh, to spy on the gathering. Uh, Lyon and Martin continued their activism on behalf of gay people and women for the next 50 years. In 1972, they wrote a pioneering book called Lesbian Woman. And in 1976, Del Martin wrote an important book called Battered Wives, which really helped spark the movement against domestic violence. In 2004, uh, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin were the first couple to be married by San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom. And that sparked the, uh, re-sparked the national movement for marriage equality. And after the California Supreme Court in 2008 um, ruled that same-sex marriages were constitutional. Oops. Um, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon were the first couple to be married in San Francisco by uh, Gavin Newsom. Uh, Del Martin died uh, two months after that, but Phyllis Lyon is still living today, and she's still continuing her activism well into her 80s uh, for equal for equal rights. So that concludes our tour. Our last stop is not a geographic location or an incident, but a website that we wanted to tell you about. And um, if any of you are studying to become teachers, we have um, lesson plans for 8th grade, 11th, and 12th grade uh, courses here in the Resource for Educators section. There are timelines, you know, extra photos. We try to update it regularly to link the history of our book to what's currently happening today in civil liberties in California. So um, as you can see, women in California have a lot to, to remember and a lot to celebrate because we've been, um, as we tried to share with you today, in the forefront of so many different kinds of struggles for, uh, for labor, for freedom of speech, uh, for immigrant rights, for um, the fight against race uh, segregation, um, for lesbian and gay rights, and so many others. So I hope that some of these stories will inspire you um, both to look into our past and to help shape our future. Thank you.